It's lovely for me to welcome you to our Sunday service here at Ridgeway Community Church, Redditch. And I do hope you'll be blessed as you join with us today. A little later on, Benjamin Howlett, a member of Monny Hull Church in Birmingham, will be preaching for us. So we pray God's blessing upon him and upon you as you listen. But it's good to sing praises, isn't it, to our God? And that's how we're going to begin this morning. So let's join together in the words of this lovely hymn. for bringing us together this morning here and we pray that for each one here there will be a, a lovely sense of the presence of the risen Lord Jesus in the midst and will you speak into every heart from youngest to oldest we pray help us to truly worship to bow before you our Lord and our God and all oh, will you grant that in our hearts would be true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know there are always those, Lord, who do not believe, who either watch a recording of the service or attend. And we pray for them too. Oh, Lord, will you open the eyes of those who do not see? Open the closed hearts of some who do not believe, we, we pray. And we thank you that as we gather here this morning that we're not alone. There are many, many people throughout the land who are meeting together this morning under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, believing in him, loving him, desiring to please him and serve him. And we pray that they with us and we with them will be blessed this morning in such great measure that we will go to our homes rejoicing, being glad that we gather together with your people this morning and we're in this place. In Jesus' name, Amen. We're going to sing again, so let's turn your eyes upon Jesus.
side where justice and mercy embrace there the son of god gave his life for us and our measure It's lovely to have uh, Wycliffe with us. Wycliffe is from Kenya and he heads up Christ Care Ministries International. Never quite sure which way to put it when you're talking about another brother or sister in the Lord, whether to say that having met him and spoken with him and heard him, that he is a remarkable man or rather a man with a remarkable God, even our God, in terms of the way that, well, Wycliffe was, was saved. It's, it's a, lovely, a lovely account. Um, and really, it's, it's a privilege to be able this morning to uh, pray for Wycliffe and kind of send him on his way, really. He's, he's flying out on Friday um, back to Megori County, so Lily and his wife will is, is back there at, at home and the family and of course what awaits him then is the, the full burden of 
the varied ministries for which he is responsible, which includes churches that he teaches the pastors, there's the ministry amongst the widows, especially the HIV positive widows, there's the school, along with the orphans, and there's some rehabilitation work that goes on as well, using sport. So, and there's the rescue centre that um, has recently been, uh, kind of had new premises and so on, which is, is lovely. So there's an ongoing work and I always feel when I come across these things that they are so much bigger than me. And I'm sure you feel, feel the same about it. It's a huge and vast ongoing going need. But it's lovely that Wycliffe is there and the ministry is established and ongoing. And we're privileged as a church and some individuals among us they know to have given in a small way financially to the work. So it's my privilege this morning to pray for Wycliffe. So I'd like him to come and stand by me. I ought really get a chair for me to stand on, didn't I? Because he's, he's such a big fellow. So I have to look up to you. Come this side of me, I think, yeah. And, um, and knowing that I was going to do this, because Wycliffe requested this, knowing that I was going to do this, was I thought, I want, to, I want to be able to say something to him from God's word that I hope can just lodge in his heart. He probably doesn't remember what I said to him last time. But I'm not going to say that again, so uh, something a little different. And this is Paul's first letter to the churches in, in, in Corinth in the first century. And um, this is what he says. I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great and effective door has opened to me. Now, you... I don't know, if you don't, if you don't know that part of the scripture, I wonder what you would expect to follow that statement, a great and effectual door is open to me. Now that's certainly true for, for Wycliffe, having his own uh, people on his heart wanting to bring the gospel to them. And of course the fact that through the school and the widow's ministry and the rescue ministry and the rehabilitation ministry, all of those things, Wycliffe is concerned to make Jesus Christ known. Because you can feed a hungry child, but they still need, don't they, to hear about Jesus. And of course it would be inappropriate to tell a hungry child about Jesus and not give them food to eat. So there's an intertwining, isn't there, in those, in those ministries. So it's a, it's a huge responsibility for Wycliffe. And in a way, you could say that great and effective door has been opened to him ever since its inception. He's been a willing servant along with many other folk then and other supporters. And the Apostle said, A great and effective door is open to me in Ephesus. What would you expect him to say next? Well, this is what he writes. He says, And there are many adversaries. How about that? So there's this great opportunity, this mission field, if you like, this great need that surrounds him. And he can see that the gospel is having effect that the Lord is working in the hearts of people in Ephesus. And so he, he wants to stay, he wants to carry on preaching there, which is lovely, isn't it? That lovely sense of perseverance. And it's almost like he says, oh, and by the way, there are many adversaries. So really I think it's about perspective, isn't it? Yes. And who am I to say such a thing to you in a way because you have experienced opposition in a very real and painful way way over the years um, in, in your ministry, particularly from those um, who follow Islam, have not been happy to, to see Wycliffe with the gospel and also saving children. And some of these folks are involved in trafficking these children that Wycliffe then rescues before they can be trafficked. So he's faced opposition and challenges apart from the financial challenges there are and the need for vision. So be encouraged and keep your perspective aright. You know, that the, the Lord is at work, the opportunity he has set before you, the work that he has called you to. And as much as in you is then to think of it as almost, oh, by the way, there are difficulties. By the way, there are, there is opposition. But to know that God is with you and 
uh, enable you. So it's my privilege, really, to just pray with you now. So I'm, I'm going to do that. Let's join together, shall we, and bow in the presence of the Lord and ask for God's blessing from with you, family and ministry. Father, we thank you for the, the glorious, and it is a glorious message of salvation, of forgiveness, of cleansing through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for bringing Wycliffe to yourself all those years ago. Thank you for your call upon his life to preach the gospel and reach out and help those needy children and women and others, Lord, in Migori County. And though there be adversaries, though there be difficulties and challenges amidst all the pressing responsibilities that he feels, I pray, Heavenly Father, as he lifts up his eyes and sees anew the Lord Jesus Christ in the wonder of his love and his ability to be able to do exceedingly more than we can even ask or think. Father, help him. Help others to support him in the way which is most appropriate for the needs. Father, for those boys and girls in the orphanage, in the school, those boys and girls in the rescue shelter, Father, for those ladies with a death sentence of HIV upon them, for those, Lord, who have got mixed up in alcohol and drug addiction. For the pastors who seek to nurture the little flocks in those churches that have been planted through these past decades. In the midst of all of this, I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit will guide, protect, provide and give wisdom and perseverance to our brother Wycliffe in this ministry. And we thank you, Father, for the privilege in some but a small way of assisting and supporting. Oh Lord, we ask today for him a safe return, a blessing in reuniting with Lee and his wife and family and all those with whom he has to do. And Father, for those who would and do oppose him and seek to trip him up and cause him to stumble and cause him harm, Father, in your grace and power, will you save them and bring them to yourself? Like the Apostle Paul, who once as Saul, then, after being saved by your grace, began to preach the faith he once set out to destroy. We pray it might be like that in Migori County, in ones and twos and tens and twenties. Add to your church there, we pray. And we pray there will be much joy in your presence, Father, in the presence of the angels over sinners who come to faith in Jesus. We ask in his name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, my brother. Thank you very much.
join with me in prayer again as we pray? I want to pray for a situation in Romania. This is, um, as you know, Alex is um, part of the church here, and her husband John. She's, they've got, she's got family in Romania, and the weather conditions are causing lots of problems. It's not greatly publicised, I don't think. I don't think I've seen anything particularly about it. So it's good to hear from her directly. And she just asked us to pray, because it's very difficult. On the one hand, there are extreme temperatures, high temperatures in one part, and also then there are heavy rainstorms causing uh, problems, uh, bringing damage to crops and properties and so on. So um, I messaged Alex and said this morning that we will pray for her family and just the people generally in Romania. Um, Many needs, aren't there? So... Let's uh, come before the Lord in prayer. Pray for our new government too, can't we? You know, you don't have to have a particular political persuasion to pray for those in authority because we have the instruction in God's word that we should do so to pray for them. So I want to include that. So let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, although it is our duty to, to pray for you, call us to pray, yet it is also our privilege and our delight for when we draw near to you, you draw near to us, that is real. And we pray this morning as together, although one voice yet together, we lift up our hearts in prayer and ask that you would just touch us now as we, we come in prayer. We need the help of your Holy Spirit to, to guide us in our praying. Thank you, Lord, that in our weakness you, you give strength. In our sometimes aimlessness you give focus and direction. Will you do that this morning? Rather your Holy Spirit would descend and move among us even in our time of prayer this morning I want to pray Lord for our land we pray for Sakia Starmer the new cabinet members people in positions of responsibility of power with a small p for you Lord our Lord of all in your heart is the king's In your hand is the king's heart to turn like a river, whichever way you choose. So we pray for him. We think that as in every heart there is a need for a humbling. How easily authority goes to our heads. We think we can do just what we like, how we like, when we like. To be thoughtless and inconsiderate or even callous. Oh Lord, will you keep this cabinet from such things? Your word reminds us that sin, departure from your ways, enmity, rebellion, is a disgrace, a disgrace to any people. But righteousness, your righteousness, the right ways, your ways, submission to your authority, Righteousness exalts a nation. Lord, we want blessing in our land, not material prosperity, not international influence or dominance. Father, we want to see the gospel prosper. We want to see men and women bowing before your throne, that Amazing throne of grace. Grace that extends to the chief of sinners. Grace which means that there is hope for every living man and woman, boy and girl, young person in the world today alive. Oh Lord, we pray that even in Redditch here, 
in this district, in the districts that we represent, that in these coming months that we would have the joy of seeing the gospel proclaimed in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray for the new MP for Redditch and District, Chris Law. And again, Lord, we see the need of real humility. Oh, Lord, that men would bow before you. So we pray for this man, work in his life. We do pray. And the other members of Parliament represented by the different districts of people here this morning, those who are watching online, Father, we pray for them as influencers and lawmakers. Oh Lord, will you hold evil at bay and that they might promote righteousness. And in any event, Father, we pray that your church, those who are blood-bought, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, might stand firm upon the truth of your word, neither give an inch nor flinch no matter what happens in our country in relation to legislative matters, that we would honour Jesus first and foremost. For you, Lord, are the final authority. It is to you whom ultimately we'll give account for what we do, for what we receive, for what we believe. Lord, bless this church has it expressed here in Ridgeway Community Church, we pray. There are needy folk among us. For that reason, some not here this morning, you know the needs, the circumstances of their lives. Lord, will you speak into their hearts? And for those, Lord, that are weak in body, help them. We think especially of Shirley and Dawn. Oh Lord, will you bless these two ladies and their household. Lord, as needed, bring salvation, we pray. Father, we pray especially for Annika, due to give birth this weekend. Oh Lord, will you watch over her and David and little Kezia and for this little unborn one. Father, will you bring him gently, smoothly into the world and bring such a savour of sweetness and joy into their household, we pray. And others, Lord, too, in their need. Father, I pray that you will bless the expectant mothers and strengthen them and the parents with young children. Lord, encourage them. Give them wisdom as they seek to bring up their little ones in the fear and admonition of the Lord, we pray. And protect those young and vulnerable minds. And Father, we pray that in our fellowship that we will ever be an encouragement to those who are parents of young children. To come alongside them. To pray for them to respond warmly to them, to be accepting, as it were, of the patter of tiny feet and the shuffle of little precious souls, we pray. Father, I want to pray for Alex and her family, especially her family then in Romania and the peoples affected by these adverse weather conditions. On the one hand, the extreme temperatures in the 40s, and the torrential rains and storms that wreak so much havoc across the land. Father, we pray that men and women there might turn to you and seek your face. Lord, will you have mercy? Lord, will you bring more seasonable, as it were, weather? Spare them the loss of crops, the loss of homes, even the loss of lives of loved ones, we pray. We thank you for Alex and for John. Will you bless them and help them also, we pray. And Lord, in these days in which we live, 
Will you yet grant that many sons be brought to glory in our families and communities and workplaces? Thank you, Lord, for your gracious providence that has placed us among our neighbours where we live, our workplaces where we work. Thank you for your lovely provision that you have made for us. So many different ways, and we've seen your hand upon our lives. Pray, Lord, that each of us will know your guiding hand upon us and reach out trusting you. Lord, we, we cannot see what tomorrow brings. But Lord, we walk with you and we know that tomorrow is in your hands and we are safe. For Lord, those everlasting arms that are underneath us are exactly that. Everlasting, never tiring, never failing, never ceasing to uphold your people, even in the most turbulent of times. So we thank you for today. Thank you for being able to enter your presence. Thank you for being able to call upon your name. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Yeah, so we're in Daniel thank you, chapter 5. Before we read Daniel 5, I'll just, because um, we're jumping in midway through a book, I'll just briefly explain where we are in the book before I read it. So Daniel 1 begins with Nebuch- King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon defeating Jerusalem and plundering the temple and basically kidnapping all the most promising people and taking them back to Babylon. Daniel and his three friends um, being included in that number who've been Jews in Jerusalem, Jerusalem's been beaten and they are taken off as exiles to Babylon. So they're living um, as God's people, but in a foreign land, far from home. Um, and that's, what da- that's kind of the book of Daniel. As we get to Daniel chapter five, it's about 50 years later. Um, so 50 years have passed roughly since Daniel chapter one. Um, and that's where we are now with Daniel chapter five. And I'll read the whole chapter. Okay, so Daniel five. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, wine, commanded that vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple of the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood and stone. Immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's colour changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold round his neck and shall be a third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his colour changed and his lords were perplexed. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your colour change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans and astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show you the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. 
Now the wise men, the enchanters, have brought in, been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold round your neck and shall be a third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. For you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and of gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. But the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honoured. Then from his presence the hand was sent and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, mene, tekel and parsim. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck and a proclamation was made about him that he would be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. That's our reading for this morning. Um, we're going to sing one more time, and then um, we'll spend more time in that passage. We're going to sing, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. of my disgrace and gave me life again who crushed my curse of sinfulness and clothed me in his light and wrote his law of righteousness with power upon my heart Filled with thankfulness to him who walks beside, who floods my weaknesses with strength and causes fears to fly, whose every promise is enough for every step I take. Sustaining me with arms of love And crowning me with grace My heart is filled with thankfulness To Him who reigns above Whose wisdom is my perfect peace Whose every thought 
is a lie For every day I have on earth Is given by the King So I will give my life My all to love and follow Him To love and follow Him Bill just let me know that there is um, next door there's a crash um, as well, so there's a chance to go out there now if that's uh, convenient. Um, before we spend time in Daniel 5, I'm going to pray uh, and then we'll um, dig into Daniel chapter 5. Heavenly Father, thank you um, for your written word. Thank you that as we open the Bible, we know this is how the living God speaks to us today. Lord, we pray that um, as we spend time in your word now, we would hear you speaking to us. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen, encourage, challenge, convict each one of us. Pray that your spirit be working in our hearts as we hear your word, um, speaker and hearer alike. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Let me me take you back in time, not too far, um, to the 31st of October 2019, okay? In just two days' time, England are about to play South Africa in the Rugby World Cup final. You have to forgive me for starting with a rugby reference straight away. And the British media are so confident that England are going to win that one person even wrote in the newspapers that England have one hand on the trophy already. Such was the confidence. And two of England's most experienced players, Dan Cole and Joe Marr, they're doing a press interview. And it's impossible to get a straight answer from them. They just spend the whole time laughing, joking, as if this isn't that much of a big deal. Such is their confidence that victory is definitely theirs. Of course, there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance. Confidence and pride, isn't it? Where does one stop and the other begin? Because just two days later, and South Africa have utterly dismantled the English team and emerged victorious by 20-point margin, a convincing victory. And the English team, particularly those two men who gave that joking press conference, are absolutely pilloried in the press. Pride, it seems, does come before a fall. Pride does come before a fall. As as I've said, we come to Daniel uh, chapter 5 today, and throughout the first four chapters of the book, it's mostly been focused on seemingly the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. Daniel was a young man, probably a teenager, when he was taken from uh, from Jerusalem to Babylon. He's now probably in his 60s. 50 years or so have passed. And as you read the book, you'll see Daniel has been faithful continually, despite living far from home, despite seemingly being a defeated man from a defeated nation. He has been faithful to God and has been granted great success by God. What's the secret to his longevity? What's the secret to his success? Well, it's his knowledge that you see throughout the book of Daniel that God is sovereign, and because of that, Daniel will serve him. And we come to chapter 5 today, and there's a sudden change of pace. We're... Like I say, the first four chapters have been focused on the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. And in chapter 5, we're suddenly introduced to a new player. We're introduced to King Belshazzar. And in this chapter, Daniel goes straight to the very end of King Belshazzar's reign. So we read nothing in Daniel about what happens to the end of Nebuchadnezzar's reign and how he ends up not being king. We read nothing about King Belshazzar's reign up until this point. We read him here throwing a huge party while the enemies are at the gates. But we don't read of anything about why he's so confident. We read nothing of Babylon's defences. If you kind of study the history, you'd realise that what the Medes did, they diverted the river 
so that they could kind of wade through shallow under the, under the walls. But we read nothing of their military genius. We read nothing of all those things. Why has all of that been missed out? And what we have, why has that been included? Well, it's important to remember that actually the book of Daniel is not primarily a book that teaches us history, as interesting as the history might be. This book is written to teach us about God. This book is written particularly for people who are living in exile, living far from home, to strengthen them in the knowledge of the sovereignty of God. The Jews in this people, God's people, are living far from Jerusalem, they're living far from home, they're living as a minority who are oppressed and beaten far from home. And I wonder if that's somehow how it feels to be a Christian today. A small, maybe sometimes feels like a defeated people who are living, well, we're not, this isn't our home. Our home is in heaven. We're living away from home. Well, this book is written to teach us not about Babylon, not about Belshazzar, not even about Daniel. This book is here to teach us about God, and it teaches us that God is overall. God rules, God reigns, and in Daniel chapter 5, we read that God will flatten pride. God will flatten defiance. God will not. He is sovereign over the pride and defiance of mankind. And that's the first thing we'll look at in this, in this chapter. The first point is this. We see that defiance is confronted by God. Defiance is confronted from, by God. From verse 10 onwards, most of the chapter is actually a record of what people are saying. But the first nine verses, kind of, we're setting the scene. We're getting the context. And we see Belshazzar here throwing this incredibly extravagant party. He made a feast in verse 1 for a thousand of his lords. And his wives and concubines are there as well. Thousand nobles, wives, concubines, they're all together. They're feasting, they're drinking, they're having a wonderful party with the enemy army camped outside. You know that we read at the very end of that night, the Medes came in and took the city. Outside the city, the Medes and Persian armies are camped. In the city, Belshazzar throws the biggest party of his life, it seems, a thousand nobles. Clearly, Belshazzar the king is supremely confident. He has absolutely no doubt that Babylon is secure. He is secure. He doesn't need to worry. He's got plenty of time. His kingdom's secure. He can throw a party. What does he have to fear? Eat, drink, make merry. He sounds, if you were to read Daniel chapter 4, which comes before, he sounds a lot like his predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, did. His pride is remarkable. But see, his pride and his defiance, they're not just in relation to his military position and his military security. His pride, his arrogance, is also actually direct defiance against God. See, as they're enjoying themselves, as they're having this party, Belshazzar starts to... He sounds a bit like a a kind of child with his friends around. He starts to show off. He gives the command, you know, go to the storerooms and get those cups that we, you know, that my father Nebuchadnezzar took from Jerusalem. You know, when we, you remember when we beat Jerusalem, we plundered the temple, we stole all those cups. Go and get those, and let's drink from those instead. He starts to drink the wine from items that were plundered from the temple of the living God. It's kind of like laughing in the face of God. And as he does so, it says in verse 4 that he, as he does that, he praises the man-made idols of Babylon. On the one hand, he laughs at God, on the other hand, he worships false gods. Such is his pride, such is his arrogance. He has no respect, no fear of God. In his mind, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, or well, he was defeated when Jerusalem was defeated. When Jerusalem was conquered, so was God. Belshazzar's the king and he is greater. He laughs at God. God is someone to be dismissed. God is someone to be laughed at. God is someone little. Belshazzar has beaten him. He dismisses God. You know, when the press stated that England had one hand on the trophy already, the arrogance, they were just, they were treating the opposition with, it's like the opposition weren't even there. Just completely dismiss the opposition. We're guaranteed to win. They don't matter. They're insignificant. They're not even a thought. Well, that's Belshazzar's view of the living God. Someone to be dismissed. A ridiculous idea. A weak God that he can laugh at because he has been defeated. That's what Belshazzar thinks of God. And throughout this book, actually, if you read the book, and I'd encourage you to go away and read it, it's it's a fascinating book. 
what you would see is that actually that is, of course, not the case. In the very first book of Daniel, uh, the first chapter of Daniel, sorry, and in the very like, first couple of verses, Daniel makes it clear that the only reason that Babylon beat Jerusalem is because God gave Jerusalem in hand. God is in control. The only reason Belshazzar has any position is because God has given it to him. But Belshazzar's view was that God had been defeated. And I wonder, maybe, for a Jewish person who is living in Babylon as an exile, that might have often been how it felt. They might have often felt like they were defeated. They're living under this king who laughs at them, this king who laughs at their God. It might have sometimes felt like they were defeated, that God has failed them, that they were little, oppressed and insignificant. Maybe that's how it felt for the Jews. Or maybe sometimes that's how it feels for us. You know, we live in a country that seems to be moving further and further away from the Bible. And in fact, actually, the idea of the God of the Bible being real and relevant to most people is at best ridiculous and at worst odious, isn't it? And that's what most people think of the God of the Bible. Maybe our beliefs and views are, are viewed as kind of laughable relics of an era of in the past, you know, they, the Bible's been debunked by kind of post-enlightenment ideology. Much like the God of the Jews in Daniel 5 appears to be an outdated relic that's been defeated by Nebuchadnezzar. That's what Belshazzar thinks. He laughs at God while worshipping little man-made statues. I mean, the irony would be quite funny if it wasn't quite so tragic. You know, when people laugh at our faith, when people mock our faith, who is it that they're laughing at? Are they laughing at us? No, they're laughing primarily at God. That's what Belshazzar's doing here. He's laughing in the face of God. That's what people are doing today, isn't it? They laugh at God whilst putting their faith in worthless idols. Daniel's written to strengthen God's people who are living in exile. To strengthen God's people who feel weak and defeated. And what's the first thing we see? Well, that defiance is confronted by God. In the very moment as he's laughing God, as he's boasting and glorifying in himself and mocking God, God speaks, doesn't he? The hand appears and writes on the wall. And unsurprisingly, I suppose, the king is terrified. You know, his defiance turns into dread in verse 5. And what's his first reaction? Well, again, if you read the first few chapters of the book, his reaction is the same as his predecessors. He turns straight to his false religion. He turns to his astrologers. He turns to his enchants. He turns to the Babylonian religion. But he finds it to be futile. He turns to all these, his wise men. They can't provide an answer. And we read in verse 9 that it seems his terror is increased. He is even more terrified when he realises that what he thinks is, it has won, what he puts his trust in, is futile. You see, he can laugh at God, he can think nothing of God, but God sees, God knows, God rules and reigns, and he can shake even the foundations of kings, as he is doing here to each other. He's shaking his pride and showing him, that actually, what you think is great, you think you've defeated me, but no, what you put your trust in is futile. God still rules, God still reigns, God is not mocked. And you know, because Daniel knows that, because Daniel knows that God is supreme, because God, Daniel knows that God still rules, he is able to have confidence in God. God will confront defiance. That brings to our second point. That actually, we've got defiance confronted by God, then we see a humble confidence in God. It's amazing, isn't it? One moment, Belshazzar goes from mocking God and worshipping idols and the next he's absolutely it says his knees are knocking together and his colour changes he kind of goes pale and shaky such as his terror and he has no idea where to turn until finally in verse 10 for the first time we see someone in this chapter talking sense as Belshazzar's wife comes in as she says to husband calm down <laughs> you know there is someone in the kingdom who can help who is it? well it's one of the men who serves the God that Belshazzar thinks is utterly ridiculous. He says to, Dan, to Belshazzar, call Daniel in. He's already proved that he will be able to help. He's done it before. And she says in verse 11, it's because the spirit of the gods is in him. 
She's close, isn't she? She's almost there. She recognises that Daniel has wisdom that is divine. A wisdom that comes from the gods. But she slightly misses the point, doesn't she? She fails to realise that actually it comes from the one true God. Anyway, she says, bring in Daniel. And she doesn't actually mention to, Daniel, to, to Belshazzar that Daniel is one of the Jews. And it seems that up until this point, Belshazzar has forgotten about Daniel. It's clear that he is aware who Daniel is. Because in verse 13, when Daniel's brought in, Belshazzar clearly knows who Daniel is. He says, I, Daniel, one of the exiles that my father the king brought from Judah. He's aware who Daniel is. He's aware that he's one of the Jews who's brought from Jerusalem. And the way he addresses him, are you Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah? He doesn't really see him as anyone. He sees him as nothing. He's Daniel, one of those defeated little people that his father had conquered 50 years previously. That's who Daniel is in, Neb- in Belshazzar's eyes. But Daniel comes in and you've got all the royal advisors, all the Babylonian wise men, all the astrologers, all these pagan religious people are in the room and Daniel, the forgotten man, is brought in. Clearly, he's a bit of an outsider. One Daniel against the thousand nobles and all the astrologers of Babylon. Daniel, the forgotten one, wasn't even invited to the party, but he's brought in. It's ironic, isn't it? But amidst the irony, we see the sovereign power of God, don't we? The mightiest ruler in all the world at the time has been made to see by God that the answer to his conundrum, the answer to his problem, can only be found in the seemingly broken, seemingly defeated God of Israel. The one who he thinks is rubbish is the only one who can answer his problem. But it doesn't bother Daniel, does it? He doesn't care. He's not interested in human power. He's not interested in their authority. He's not interested. Now, I did some research, and it turns out, at least in the States, the going rate, like an average salary for a code breaker ranges from like seventy-five dollars to $130,000. So I don't know what American salary is like, but that sounds like a decent wage to me. Well, Belshazzar promises Daniel immense riches to, br- riches to break the code. He says, if you can translate, if you can interpret this writing, I'll clothe you in purple, you have a gold chain, and I'll make you the third highest person in all my kingdom. You'll have unbelievable power, you'll have wealth, you'll have status, you'll prestige. And in Daniel's response, we see that he has a humble confidence in God. You know, the book is written to show us that God is over all things, and that should strengthen those of us who follow him, but should also be a challenge to those people who don't. So there's a contrast here between Belshazzar and Daniel. Belshazzar gives no thought to God. He has no respect for God. He dismisses God. And actually, in the way he offers reward to Daniel, he kind of assumes that all anyone could ever want is what he has to offer. What's the greatest thing someone could have? Well, it's this power, it's this wealth, it's this prestige. What I have got, that's what people would want. He doesn't see that actually God rules, God reigns, but Daniel knows that. And his response in verse 17, you may keep, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. It's incredible, isn't it? Just pause and think for a moment about, about what Daniel's just said. He's one of the exiles. He's one of those people that Belshazzar thinks is insignificant and rubbish. And he's standing before the king who's got the authority to have him killed on the spot. And he says, I'm not interested in anything you've got to offer. Keep your rubbish. I'm not interested in any knickknacks. I'm not interested in any position you can offer me. I, I don't care about that. Keep it for yourself. I'm not bothered by it. How is it that Daniel has the confidence to say that before the king. Well, sure it's because throughout all his experience so far, he has come to learn that God is in charge, not Belshazzar. He serves a higher power. He serves a different king. You know, he'll do what Belshazzar asks of him. But he doesn't care about the rewards that Belshazzar has to offer. Daniel is interested in not earthly rewards, but Daniel has a heavenly confidence and looks for a heavenly reward. He doesn't care about what Belshazzar offers. He cares about honouring God. You know, Jordan Belfort was a, a stockbroker who went to prison for fraud, so you know, don't, don't follow his example. What he used to do was he, used to, he bought cheap and worthless stocks and through misinformation sold them as high value and defrauded investors of up to $200 million. 
What he offered people, he made it to look wonderful, but in reality it was worthless. You know, if the investors had known the real value of what he was offering, they wouldn't have had any interest in it. Daniel sees that the real value of what Belshazzar offers is meaningless compared to what is of true value towards, compared to serving God, what Belshazzar has to offer, not interested in that. That's not, that's not of value. He knows what's of value. He lives for heavenly reward. He knows that God of heaven, that Christ himself is the great treasure and nothing that Belshazzar can offer comes close. You know, what does Christ say in Matthew 6? He says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Daniel has a humble confidence in God and as such as a heart for God and for his rewards. And I wonder, what is it you're living for today? What is it that you're chasing? What rewards are you looking for? Are you looking for, I don't know, a better career or a better car than the next door neighbour or a better garden than your next door neighbour maybe? Better grades than your friends, more followers on social media, whatever it might be. These things are worthless. They mean nothing. Daniel can reject all that the world has to offer. He can reject all the riches of Babylon. And he can speak the words of God because he understands that God is sovereign. God is the eternal king, not Belshazzar. All the other things will come and go, but God is eternal and he will serve him. Can we say the same in our lives? Are we more interested in what the world around us offers? Or do we realise that these things fade and perish and pass away, but God's kingdom endures forever? Therefore, we want to serve him and his reward. We see defiance confronted by God. We see a humble confidence in God. And finally, we see that judgment is passed by God in verses 18 to the end of the chapter. Judgment passed by God. My wife and I, I can say this because she's just gone out of the room, but my wife and I are very different. In most situations, my wife has the uncanny ability to assume that the worst case scenario is the only possible outcome. And I tend to go the other way, and I tend to assume that nothing bad will ever happen, it'll all just blow over in the end. But I wonder, have you ever been in a situation where actually the reality turned out to be far worse than your worst case scenario in your mind? Well, that's basically what happens to Belshazzar. He is just terrified about this unknown writing and this mysterious hand. He thinks, if I can just find out what it is, then I'll be happy. As Daniel gives him the message, it turns out the reality is far worse than Belshazzar thought. The interpretation was much, much worse than he could possibly have imagined. Daniel, he will declare what the writing means, but before he gets to that, he addresses Belshazzar very directly and very personally. We'll see that the message written by God is one of judgment. But before Daniel gets to that, he wants to talk directly to Belshazzar and tell him the context. Why is God declaring judgment on Belshazzar? And we read in verses 18 through to 23 that Belshazzar is in no way unaware of what God has done. In those verses, Daniel kind of recounts the story of what God has done in the life of King Nebuchadnezzar, who came before him. He speaks of how God gave Nebuchadnezzar his power, how God gave Nebuchadnezzar his dominion, how God gave Nebuchadnezzar success. He tells Belshazzar of how God brought Nebuchadnezzar low because of his pride. He talks of how God restored Nebuchadnezzar's position. He talks of how God has done all these things, how it's God who's been at work throughout Nebuchadnezzar's life. But more importantly, he tells Belshazzar that he knew all of it and has ignored it. He says, you, Belshazzar, you know all this. You saw it. You lived through this. You've experienced this. You know everything I've said. You know everything that God did to King Nebuchadnezzar. Time and again in your life, you have seen the evidence that God is in control. You've seen God's power. You've seen God's authority. You've seen the consequences of not acknowledging God as God. And you've ignored it all and you've acted in defiance against God. You've got all the evidence before you and you've chosen to ignore it. Therefore, God is pronouncing judgment. 
know, cigarette packets all have warnings on now, don't they? And some of them are as simple and blunt as just saying, smoking kills. Yet every day, people pick up a cigarette for the first time, choose to smoke it, and become addicted. The warnings are there, but they're ignored. Belshazzar has had all the warnings, all the evidence of the danger of ignoring God. He says, you've ignored it. You have not done it. You have raised yourself up against God. You've willfully ignored God's warning. Therefore, God has sent you this message. And now Daniel interprets it. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Belshazzar, your days are in God's hands and they end today. Tackle, you've been weighed in the scales and found wanting. Clearly, God's scales are different to other people's scales. For most people, they look at Belshazzar and think, wow, what a fantastic man, what great success he's had. He must be doing something right. But no, you've been weighing God's scales, you've been found wanting, you've fallen short of God's standard. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Not just Belshazzar, but actually Babylon as a whole is ended tonight. The Medes and the Persians are going to take over, your kingdom is brought to an end. This actually is the start of a fulfilment of the vision that God gives in Daniel chapter 2. We see that God is sovereign over history and over the rise and fall of empires. He gives the interpretation, then we read, Belshazzar gives the rewards to Daniel, and almost as a side note, we read that that night, Belshazzar was killed and Darius to me took over. This is a huge event of history, isn't it? This is one kingdom coming to an end, another kingdom rising, the assassination of a king, Yet in Daniel 5, it has a brief mention. That's not what's important. What's important to note is that this is a judgment from God. This isn't an account of of Babylonian history. This is an account of God's power and God's authority and God's dealings with people. That night, Belshazzar was killed. Well, how does this apply to us? These are events that, you know, I find them fascinating. I I quite like history. They're interesting. But how does it apply to us? What we see here in Daniel 5 is that actually, no matter how it looks, no matter how defeated God's people seem to be, no matter how powerful God's opponents seem to be, we see here that actually God is the highest power. God rules and reigns over all. God will humble the proud. God writes and controls all of history. So what do we take from that today? Well, I suppose there's two ways of thinking, isn't it? Firstly, I suppose, if we are followers of Christ, if we truly love God and follow him, actually this account can serve as a real encouragement to us. We've just had an election, haven't we? We have seen this week power rise and power fall. We've had a general election and power has changed. And who knows what the next five years are going to bring? Haven't we clue, do we? We don't know what's going to happen. What do we know? We know that the power that is now is there because God has put it there. And one day it won't be there because God will take it away again. It isn't forever, just like Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar weren't forever. They are put there for a time by God, but God is in control. And the same is true today. You know, we can turn on the news and we see evil leaders waging war against the helpless people, oppressing Christians around the world. We see ideologies pushed that, that just completely contradict the biblical Uh, created order on things like sexuality we see all around us that God is seen as irrelevant and outdated we see the literal reading of Genesis as seen as a ridiculous and laughable idea why would someone believe that to be true we see defiance against God everywhere we look but we can be encouraged because God rules and reigns and he will bring the proud down he will bring them low those who stand in opposition to God will be humbled and will be judged Earthly kingdoms don't last forever. God's kingdom does. God's kingdom will endure. So we can trust him. We can serve him as Daniel did. We don't need to fear. We don't need to worry about what this world has to offer. God rules history, both in past and in eternity future. Now we can look to Christ, can't we? He died for our sins, was raised to life again, and is now alive in heaven, sovereign over all things, And he's on our side. And we can serve him and look for his rewards and not worry about the fleeting things of this earth. God will bring these things to an end, but his kingdom will last forever. It's an encouragement to us to persevere, to keep serving God, looking for the future, 
looking to heavenly reward. But actually this chapter, it serves both as an encouragement, but also as a challenge and a warning. It serves as a warning to those who are ignoring God. Belshazzar knew all that God had done. He had no excuse. He could not plead ignorance to to what God had done. He'd seen it all. He knew it all. He had chosen to ignore. You know, if you're here today, maybe you come to church most weeks and you've heard the Bible taught many, many times. Do you know you're in in an even more privileged position than Belshazzar? Because you know even more of what God has done than Belshazzar did. You know, each week we come and we open this book and we read of the Lord Jesus Christ. We read of how God became a man, lived a perfect life. We hear his teachings, we see his miracles, we see how he died on the cross for our sins and came back to life to offer us eternal life. We read in this book the warnings of ignoring all that. We have so much more knowledge of what God has done than Belshazzar did. We can look back at all of what Christ has done. We can't plead ignorance any more than Belshazzar could. We know what God has done. We have seen what God has done in the person of Christ. You know, if we don't humble ourselves and turn to God, then one day God will pronounce judgment on us in the same way he did to Belshazzar. You know, Belshazzar was told, I have numbered your days and brought you to an end. You know, God will say that to us. God is sovereign over all eternity. He's sovereign over the number of your days, over my days. One day he will bring them to an end. He will say to us, I have weighed you in the scales and found you wanting. You know, the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of his glory. He'll pronounce us unworthy of his kingdom. If you don't turn to him, he will pronounce you unworthy of his kingdom and condemn you to punishment. He says, oh, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. All that Belshazzar had acquired was given to someone else, was left behind, was left behind for other people. There's a story, I'm not sure if it's true or not, of a great businessman who was very successful and acquired great wealth, and then he, he died as a very rich man. And at his funeral, someone asked, oh, how much do you leave behind? To which the answer came, well, all of it, all of it. It's true, isn't it? He had all his wealth. We left it all behind. Whatever we value, whatever we live for, we can't take it with us. It will be left behind. Don't live for this world. Don't live for what you can earn and acquire in this world, for your own power, for your own greatness, for your own comfort, whatever it might be. Don't ignore God and live for this world, as Belshazzar did. Turn to him today before it's too late. Belshazzar thought he had plenty of time. Clearly, he was throwing a party with the enemy at the gate. He thought he had plenty of time. That night, God brought judgment and he was dead. That very night. Don't be like Belshazzar. Don't leave it. Don't ignore God's warnings. Turn to him while you can. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. The rest of today's not guaranteed even. Turn to Christ while you can. Turn to him. Humble yourself before him. And live for eternal reward. Not for what this world has to offer. I'm going to finish by singing one of my favourite hymns. It's When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And it's a song that... Well, it reminds us that actually nothing in this world, nothing we could possibly live for, nothing we could possibly boast in, comes even close to the wealth of knowing the crucified Christ. Whatever we might be tempted to boast about, whatever we might be tempted to think is important and live for and think makes us so special, is worthless before the blood of Christ. The only reasonable response to seeing what God has done is to offer our lives to him, as Daniel did in contrast to what Belshazzar is. So this thing, I'll ask him, and I think Bill will close afterwards.
Let's pray as we close. Heavenly Father, in your mercy, will you grant that each of us who has heard, who has listened, might know that love so amazing that does indeed demand our soul, our life, our all. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. I'm glad you've been able to join us. I hope you'll take something away with you. And I always say this, but I mean it, that you might ponder on the Word of God and be drawn close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do join us again next Sunday when I'll be continuing my series in James's letter in the New Testament. And this time we begin to look at chapter 3, which has a lot to say about the tongue. Do join us then. God bless you. <laughs>